Welcome to History That Doesn't Suck. I'm your professor, Greg Jackson, and I'd like to tell you a story. It's early July, 1754. Roughly 400 British soldiers, mostly colonials from Virginia, are pinned down by an army of 600 French and their 100 American Indian allies. The British Army occupies one of the poorest excuses for a fort you could ever imagine. It consists of what we could call a small cabin surrounded by a palisade, which is a fence made of wooden posts. It's only large enough for 70 or so men to take advantage of this lackluster protection, leaving the roughly 300 other soldiers outside with nothing more than an earthen parapet for protection. The only thing worse than the construction of this fort might be its location. We are in southwestern Pennsylvania, though given the era, we might do better to think of this as the Ohio. The fort's in an open meadow on a valley floor surrounded by hills, giving the French something of a high ground. With the tree line as close as a mere 60 yards, the French also enjoy the cover of trees as they pick off the colonials. If mid-18th century guns had actually been accurate, the fort might only be filled with the dead. The rain pouring down through the morning battle only makes matters worse for the fort's inhabitants. The small cabin structure in the middle is a far cry from waterproof, meaning they now have more wet gunpowder than dry. To make matters worse, the lack of protection from the elements for nearly all the colonials has allowed their muskets to get wet making the already arduous process of preparing their muzzle-loading rifles to fire a single shot take longer and have a higher likelihood of misfire. These issues aren't bothering the French so much. The same trees hiding them from the British fort provide significant shelter from the rain. Imagine being one of these soldiers. You're likely laying in the mud of the crude trench just in front of the fort. The continuous fire from the French ensures you stay as close to the ground as you can but that also means you're soaking in the small stream starting to form in the trench. A stream not only of rainwater, but of the blood of the dead and the wounded. Some of whom might be your friends, neighbors, family. The commander of this godforsaken scene is a 22-year-old untrained colonel thrust into his first large-scale battle. Picture him with me. In a time when the average colonial American stands roughly five foot eight, this kid towers over six foot tall. He cuts an imposing figure in his sharp red and blue uniform, although his tricorn hat has long ago failed to protect his face from the rain. The torrential rainfall is soaking his reddish hair, now matted to his face. He pushes it away from his gray-blue eyes as he desperately tries to make out what to do in the face of this much larger army, knowing that his life and that of hundreds of men depend on his decisions. He moves rapidly, splashing through the puddles of blood and rainwater, leaping over the bodies of the dead soldiers fallen under his command, shouting orders amid the sounds of swivel gun cannon, hundreds of rifles, the cries of the wounded, and the continuous drum of the rain. Who can even hear him? As the afternoon drags to a close and dark approaches, his men know the end may well be near. The French will advance in the cover of night and overrun the fort. Lacking the numbers or dry gunpowder, these men are hopeless. And so, they break into the kegs of rum stored in the fort. Because of course, there are kegs of rum. What fort worth having? wouldn't have kegs of rum. But the joking aside, the dead and soon-to-be-dead have no need to fear a hangover. They may as well have at it. What hope can this 22-year-old leader have? He's not just outgunned and outnumbered. His men are now inebriated. No one trained him for any of this. Frankly, for his sake, perhaps we should hope he had a drink too. I can't imagine what I would do. In case you haven't realized it yet, this young colonel is George Washington. Now, spoiler alert, he is going to live, and for quite a long time. After this battle in 1754, he's going to go on to lead the Continental Army of a newly fashioned America to victory 
in a war against the British Empire, beat it, then get elected unanimously by the Electoral College as the first president of the United States. And the only reason he's not going to continue to be president after his second election is because he says he's done. How on earth does this colonel from this fort on this night get from that moment to the presidency of a country that does not yet exist? Well, to understand all of that, we've got to get to know George. And to know George, we have to go back to his childhood. We have to unpack the myths and legends that surround him. Because George Washington is a figure people generally either love or hate. And the funny thing is that whatever one's feelings are about him, they are usually built on legend. Myth. In perpetuating these tales, we place George on a pedestal. This often means that, for many, he's perfect, and how dare you attack him? Which, of course, leads to an inaccurate understanding of George Washington, because a false and romanticized image of George only undermines our understanding of him and of the United States. Or, on the other side, the pedestal means we have to point out that he wasn't that great after all. Get him off the pedestal! And in the process, we can swing too far the other way. Well, of course, like any other human being, George is a mixture of both. Underneath the lore is a mortal man with admirable and negative traits. I want you to meet this George. That's the George I find interesting. That's the George I find relatable. So let's go back to George's childhood and get to know him. Ready? Rewind. <laughs> Born in 1732, George has a lot more going for him than most colonial Americans. But he's not quite as rich, gentrified, educated, or privileged as you might think. Now, I don't mean to overstate. Let's be clear. By the time the American Revolution breaks out in the 1770s, one-fifth of all Americans are enslaved. And in George's home colony slash state, 40% of Virginians are enslaved. And of course, the Washingtons own slaves. George's father, Augustine, had 20. George will own slaves too. And yes, slavery is a topic we'll fully tackle in a later episode. So I'm not saying George Washington had the hardest childhood for the era. Again, he is gentry. But growing up was harder on him than you might expect. To make a comparison to our present, the 21st century, think of George like that middle-class kid whose parents move into a rich neighborhood. You know, they find the one affordable rental. It's going to stretch their budget, but they're going to move in because they want to get Junior into that really good school district. Ah, but now the middle-class kid feels insecure because in this better school, the rich kids make fun of him for having totally worn that t-shirt just last week. Yeah, that's kind of George. And I know, getting made fun of for wearing the same shirt isn't exactly go on Dr. Phil material. But that's my point. George is still gentry, just lower gentry. His father had land and slaves, but wasn't exactly remembered for his business prowess. Speaking of George's dad, let's talk about the cherry tree. Now, we all love the cherry tree story. It's a fun way to say, Look at how important it is to be honest, just like our founding father. But alas, sources don't line up. It's probably a made-up tale. And we don't need to hold that against George. It's not like he made it up, though that would be ironic, right? If George had made up a lie to demonstrate his honesty. Anyhow, the story shows up long after he's passed. Given the lack of sources during George's life, we historians have to conclude that it was made up. Besides, can we just pause and talk about what kind of kid can chop down a freaking cherry tree? Have you ever chopped wood before? It's not the easiest thing. So I'm trying to even picture how this small child is going to take an axe and fell a tree at all, let alone before anyone else would have noticed. So it probably didn't happen. But I don't think we need to hold that against him. Okay, let's talk about George's education. So we made the comparison to the middle class kid going to a nice rich kid school. But please only take that so far as me trying to make George a little more relatable to your 21st century life. Because his formal education sucked. 
Abe Lincoln looks like a Rhodes Scholar compared to George. He picks up things as he goes, and he's bright. That's obvious. But in terms of formal education, he is severely lacking. This is another aspect of George Washington that lets us see just how low of a station he's coming from for a gentry type. See, his peers, some of the other gentrified colonial boys, they'll go to England for schooling. And that would have been George's trajectory. It's what should have happened. But his dad dies. Augustine Washington, his father, is dead by the time George is 11 years old. So again, plenty of worse things have happened to other people. But let's recap how much it does kind of suck to be George Washington. His education's lacking for his social standing. His dad's dead by the time he's 11 years old. And he's not inheriting much anytime soon. The two sons from Augustine's first wife inherit the majority, and this includes Lawrence, George's older half-brother. Lawrence receives land and a farmhouse, standing about a story and a half tall, not quite two stories. He decides to name the place after his commanding officer from his days fighting for the crown in the Caribbean, a guy called Edward Vernon. That's how it got its current name, Mount Vernon. As for George, he gets to keep carrying on with his really cranky, austere mom, who treats him, as her oldest, like the man of the house. He's supposed to eventually get the house she's in, a place called Fairy Farm, but she will hold on to this until her dying day. Although that sounds fine by our modern standards, this isn't typical for the era. And she makes George's life enough of a living hell that he prefers to cut out as often as he can to go hang out with his much cooler, older half-brother, Lawrence. Over time, this allows Lawrence, who again has inherited a place and named it Mount Vernon, to become a father figure to the fatherless George. That'll do for the basics of George's earliest years. Let's talk teens. This is where the Fairfax family comes in. They are a huge influence and hookup for George. They are serious gentry. So when you're picturing that super privileged, hooked up, I don't even know what to do with all of this cash type of gentry, that's the Fairfaxes. Pretty much everyone in the Fairfax family has something of a relationship with George. Lawrence is tied in there too. He's married into the Fairfax family. But most notably, I want to point out that Lord Thomas Fairfax, the patriarch in this patriarchal time, the big cheese, the guy with the real influence and power. He digs George. George is manly in an 18th century colonial America sort of way. George rides horses like a champ. He's awesome with hounds. And these are the manly things that men do in the same sense that manly, masculine men today play football, golf, well, whatever. This kind of depends on your corner of the world and the circles you run in, but you get it. Okay, so through the Fairfax connection, George is looking to join the British Navy. And this is awesome. Remember, Lawrence inherited George, eh, not so much. He needs a career. And he's all set. His bags are literally packed. Then his mother, remember the description I gave of her earlier? She flips out because he's deserting her. I picture a young George with his packed bags standing by his front door with his mother laying into him. Oh, George, how could you forget your mother and your duty to her? Oh, what will we do? What will I do? How will I ever manage? How could you do this? And on and on. So George doesn't go. Imagine that. You have a career, one that you're excited about, by the way. Let's add that. All you have to do is walk out of the house, and your mom stops you. That's rough. Now, knowing what we do about George and what he does later in life, I would say this isn't showing a lack of backbone, but a reflection of his concept of honor and family values. Good traits in my book. Well, George still needs a job. And the Fairfaxes aren't giving up on him either. He's still a cool guy and worth another go. So, they hire 16-year-old George to survey frontier land in the Shenandoah Valley. 
Can we pause for a second and take in the age? Yeah, he's 16. He's working. So again, if you're picturing George as this elite dude who's never done a day's worth of work in his life and has had everything handed to him, I'd encourage you to reconsider that position. I mean, surveying backcountry sounds a lot harder than my job at 16 of cooking fries at In-N-Out Burger. Though, to be fair, my paper hat wasn't nearly as cool as his tricorn. So that's a perk for him. But really, he has an amazing time doing this. He's off in the Blue Ridge Mountains. George comes across some American Indians who willingly do a war dance for him in exchange for some rum. George faces down a rattlesnake. This is all super manly stuff once again in an 18th century colonial America sort of way. George is a man's man in all the right ways to help his career. Basically, Davy Crockett's got nothing on George. And he's super excited to have the job. He needs the money. There's at least one time in his life where he notes not being able to afford to feed his horse. You know, kind of like you having a hard time coming up with gas money. Yeah, that's where George is coming from. All right, so he's got a little coin in his pocket from working for the Fairfaxes. This is where tragedy strikes. Remember how George's father died when he was 11 and his older half-brother became his father figure? Well, since it's so easy to lose one father, the universe decides George might as well lose two. Death is knocking on Lawrence's door. Lawrence is suffering from tuberculosis. And medicine being as not awesome as it is at this point in history, doctors can only tell Lawrence to get to a better climate for his lungs. Maybe that can save his life. This is why Lawrence goes to the Caribbean island of Barbados and George accompanies his beloved father figure slash half-brother. Now, if you're thinking, geez, lucky George, I want to go on an international trip to the Caribbean, let's be clear, this isn't a 21st century vacay. It's nothing like that. First, this isn't really international. This is all British territory. Britain rules both Virginia and Barbados at this point. Even still, This is the closest he'll get to an international trip. It's the only land he'll ever see in his life that won't be a part of the future United States. But really, at this point, it's like you living in Los Angeles and going to Hawaii. It's still the United States. Oh, except instead of going to Hawaii to enjoy the beach, you're going to watch your sick father figure slash half-brother die. It's on this island that George watches the man who means the most to him in the world draw his last breaths. But don't be too sad for George. There's a consolation prize. While he's there, he contracts smallpox. You know, the super deadly disease of European origin that devastated the indigenous population of the Americas after the Spanish first showed up in the Western Hemisphere. Yay for George. And I'm not being entirely sarcastic. This gives him immunity to the disease, and considering that it will be one of the greatest killers of the American Revolution, this is, in fact, a silver lining. And while I have no doubt George would rather have Lawrence alive than benefit from his death, the fact is, George may never have become the future commander of the Continental American Army and President of the United States, if not for his passing. George inherits Mount Vernon, which he'll later expand into the much larger mansion still standing today. Anne Lawrence's death means George can apply to take his office in the local militia. In some ways, it's more a social and drinking group than a militia, but nonetheless, George still has this military itch that he didn't get to scratch when his mom kept him from joining the Navy. And how is he going to land this? He's never trained as a soldier. How can he lead soldiers? Easy. He knows he doesn't need to know how to do it, just who to talk to. The past is a different place, and we need to remember that values, culture, customs, and so forth can be very different, even if it is the history of our own country. But that said, some things stay the same. Some things are timeless because we are the same species. 
Well, one of those things, a thing that transcends country and time, is networking. He starts chatting up the right people to get his beloved brother's military post. I just picture him walking up to a well-to-do Virginian and laying it on thick, like, Well, hello, sir. Just wanted to stop in and say hello. My, what a lovely wig you have. Is it new? Oh, and are you helping to decide who will hold office in the militia? Is that so? Ah, you mean the post held by my brother until his untimely passing. It works. He lands the gig. Thus, at 20 years old, George is a major in charge of training soldiers despite not having a clue himself how to soldier. And now that we've sufficiently bonded with him and figured out how he got into military leadership so young, we're almost able to see how he's going to get stuck at Fort Necessity in the middle of that terrifying meadow two years later. But it's not all a matter of knowing George. We do have to talk 1750s international politics for just a second. France and Britain are vying for world domination. At this point, France controls Canada and a lot of what is basically the middle of the United States today. You know, that's why we spell a lot of states and city names in the Midwest, well, incorrectly. I mean, Illinois. Really? There's an S at the end of that. Why don't we say Illinois? Because the French hate to pronounce the last letter, or sometimes the last few letters of any word. That's just their thing. And of course, we have the state of Louisiana, named after the most powerful king in the history of France, Louis XIV. And its most popular city, New Orleans, or La Nouvelle Orléans. It's named after Philip II, the Duke of Orleans. Well, in their separate quests for world domination and empire, France and Britain are starting to bump into each other. They are on top of each other in India, too. Their colonial ambition has them neck and neck around the world. In fact, did you ever wonder why there isn't a continent in the world that doesn't have a country using English or French as its primary, or at least official language? These colonial empires are why. Okay, so you get it. And now, in the 1750s, it's a showdown in the Ohio Valley. Rumor has it the French are fortifying from Lake Erie through the Ohio River system. Both the French and the English see the Ohio country as theirs. Meanwhile, American Indians are stuck in the middle of this. Now let me pause to address terms, since we have already talked about American Indians a bit, and are going to do so even more in a few minutes and in future episodes. There's discussion currently as to what the best term is for American Indians, with other contenders being Native Americans, Indigenous Peoples, and First Nations. That last one is quite popular in Canada. Different tribes and individuals feel differently about which one is best. All of the above, though, are considered acceptable. You may hear me flip between one term or the other, though I do tend to give preference to Indian because, as I understand it, this is the one most preferred by American Indians. If that surprises you, two major reasons for preferring a name derived from Christopher Columbus not realizing which continent he had landed on are, one, it's a way to repurpose the title, to very purposely take the power of a negative term by owning it. This is nothing new. Other groups have done this as well. Two, some American Indians like it because unlike any other term for a subgroup of Americans, The term American Indian signifies that they were on this continent first. Think about it. All other groups have an adjective that emphasizes their origin elsewhere. African Americans, Asian Americans, Hispanic Americans, or European Americans. All that said, my point is that my choice of language is very much intended to show respect. So whatever your preference might be, please know my intentions are nothing but the best. So with that addressed, as I was saying... American Indians are kind of stuck in the middle of this clash between France and Britain. And there are two things to keep in mind about American Indians here. Number one, in a relative sense, there aren't a lot of them at this point. Remember my point earlier about smallpox? So there's only about 150,000 American Indians living east of the Mississippi River, 
Contrast that with the over a million colonial Britons in the Americas. Sheer numbers put them at the mercy of these massive empires. Number two, remember that American Indians don't see themselves as American Indians, and by that I mean as a singular united people. They are from different tribes, they speak different languages, so even that 150,000 number is divided, and each tribe is going to do what it thinks is best for itself. That's why some will ally with France, others with Britain. But it does all come down to the same thing. Whomever they ally with, it's in an effort to keep their land and to stay alive. Hey, by the way, starting to get an idea as to why this upcoming war might be called the French and Indian War? Well, back in Virginia, Lieutenant Governor Robert Dinwiddie is very disturbed to hear about the French moving in on the Ohio. Maybe he's just thinking about king and country. Personally, I think it has more to do with him being a shareholder in the Ohio Company, which is a land speculation enterprise. It's kind of hard for the British to speculate on land if the French control it. So he gets the king, King George II, to order that an envoy go tell the French to back off. And if they don't, well, things might get messy. There's a problem, though. You need someone important to serve as an envoy for the king. A gentry type. Preferably with a title. But what kind of person from that level of society could handle traveling through 500 miles of rugged terrain inhabited by American Indians to go speak with the French? It's like the position was made for George Washington. The 21-year-old previous surveyor, major in the local militia, and proud owner of Mount Vernon. And he's all about this task. Basically, when he hears, what kind of gentry could deliver this message? George responds, hold my beer. Well, this is 18th century colonial America, so maybe hold my Madeira would be a better fit. That wine's like the Coca-Cola of the period. It is everywhere. Point being, It's on. George is the man for the job. George takes off to deliver the lieutenant governor's message on October 31st, 1753. He'll travel through Virginia, then up the western side of the modern-day state of Pennsylvania and back. He won't return home until January 1754. His team consists of a decent-sized group. First, we have a Dutchman named Jacob Van Brom. He's George's French interpreter and a friend of sorts who taught him how to fence when he was younger. Next is Christopher Gist, the Indian interpreter, a fur trader and an agent of the Ohio Company. There's also four backwoodsmen and, added en route at the village of Logstown, a Seneca Indian chief known to the English as Half King. He also brings along two older chiefs and one hunter. They leave Logstown with George and the rest of his crew on November 30th. So, about a month into the trip. But before we leave Logstown, you should know that George went there to call on Half King and remind him of his treaty with Britain. Half King points out that it's a trade treaty, not a military treaty, and that the British were not going to advance on the land. This is about the time Half King asks, So, why are you here? Why are you going to talk with the French? Well, this is awkward. George is smart enough to realize that the honest response might not go over well. You know, the whole, I'm going to tell the French not to build forts along this river system because my king and lieutenant governor both really want to build forts along this river system, even though this is totally your land. So George manages to stay vague and, well, crisis averted. And Half King agrees to join George. The trip has a few notable points. On December 7th, 1753, they meet and dine with a French captain, Philippe de Jonquière, who gets too drunk on wine and tells George that, quote, It was their absolute design to take possession of the Ohio, and by God, they would do it. Close quote. A few more days slugging across the wilderness in serious rain and snow, and they arrive at sunset on December 11th at Fort Le Boeuf, which is around modern-day Waterford, Pennsylvania. In taking in the scene, George can tell the French mean business. This is a serious, well-built fort, 
there are some 200 canoes that he can see. And if you have that many canoes, there have to be soldiers or allied braves who can fill them. That duly noted, George delivers the message of back off the Ohio, France, to Capitaine Jacques Le Gardeur de Saint-Pierre. The French leader could not care less. I mean, he's plenty polite. He puts on some great pomp and circumstance for George. But by the next day, Le Gardeur has a letter for George to take back to Dinwiddie, telling him that essentially, France could not care less about these British threats. Given this French threat, George is eager to give Lieutenant Governor Dinwiddie a heads up on the French army amassed here. They head back in the dead of winter. Having sent the rest of his party back in advance, George and his Indian interpreter, Gist, are now traveling alone. And they have some crazy experiences. For starters, they pick up an Indian brave as a guide at Murtheringtown Indian Village. Later on, as he is leading George and Gist, the guide suddenly dashes ahead of them 15 steps, turns, and shoots at them. Good thing for the future United States. Their guide misses his mark. Well, Gist wants to kill the brave. But George refuses and sends him off in the opposite direction. George and Gist watch their backs for quite some time after that, as you can imagine. Having survived the attempted shooting, they arrive at the Allegheny River. It's partly frozen, with ice chunks floating in it, and they have to cross this. They fashion a raft for the crossing, but it fails them. As George tries to push off an ice chunk with a pole, it gets stuck and pulled by a strong current, which in turn throws George into the freezing river. He and Gist just manage to get out of the hypothermic waters and find refuge on a small island in the river. They pass a miserable night. George's clothes are frozen as hard as rock. As you can imagine, he doesn't sleep well. When dawn breaks, they find the river has frozen over, and this is a blessing. They can now walk across the hard ice to civilization. The worst of this expedition is over. By this point, it's January 1754. George is back in Virginia and makes his report for Dinwiddie, who, to George's surprise, publishes the report. As for Dinwiddie, and remember, he is financially invested in the Ohio as a stockholder in the Ohio Company, and has the political power to pursue his agenda as the lieutenant governor of Virginia. It's clear that the French will take the Ohio if he doesn't get troops there fast. Dinwiddie manages to get the Virginian government to cough up funds for an army of 300 men. George is even mentioned as a possible commander. And can we just pause for a second to take in how crazy that is? He's 21. 21 years old. He's never been trained as a soldier. Now Dinwiddie and others think he should lead a few hundred men out into barely charted territory to potentially take on an army from one of the 18th century's greatest world powers, the French. And I know, cue up the French military defeat jokes. But you need to understand that the French have, historically, rocked it on the battlefield. They, like Britain, didn't build a worldwide empire by saying, please. But I think the interesting thing here is to note what this must say about George. From Lord Fairfax to Dinwiddie, influential and powerful men just can't seem to help handing him major responsibility. Evidently, he excels at proving his potential and capability. But George turns it down. And hey, this is the guy who will later say no to being president for a third time. Hell, He'll say no to being king of America. He seems to have a good grasp of reality and a level of concern for the welfare of the larger group that checks his own ambition to a degree. It looks like he has this trait even at a young age. He is willing, however, to take the role of second in command. So let's not confuse checked ambition for lack of ambition. And that's how the young major becomes the young lieutenant colonel. George sets out to go tell the French what's up in April with just over 150 poorly trained, ill-equipped men who are only willing to go because of promises of land as part of their payment. The other 150 of the 300 soldiers that Virginia is willing to pay for have yet to be raised. That's what George has to work with. 
As they head out, they are met by another group of 33 men who were sent ahead of them to build a fort at one of the Ohio River's forks. The returning group tells George some thousand or so French and Indians showed up and told them to pack it up and head back to Virginia. Happy to be alive, the little group got out fast. They also let George know his acquaintance, Half King, is pissed that the French have invaded. After all, this means the French are now threatening his way of life. And his only hope to dislodge the French is the British. Can you see the rock in a hard place American Indians like Half King find themselves in? It's almost like they get to choose. Be displaced by the French or the British. But either way, be displaced. Even so, in this particular situation, Britain is Half King's best bet since France currently appears more aggressive. Point being, George has an ally out here. Unfortunately, that ally is part of what is going to get George into a lot of trouble, and quick. George is now in what we call southwestern Pennsylvania, in the marshy, great meadows, preparing to build a fort. Yes, this is the fort he's going to get stuck in, called Fort Necessity. And as its construction is underway, George's old guide from last year's expedition, just, rides into camp. He reports French troops are in the area. Then some Indian braves show up. They let George know that Half King has spotted the French too, and he wants to attack. So just before 10 p.m., George and 47 of his men head out into the dark, rainy night to talk with Half King at his camp, where they agree to ambush the French together. Okay, time out. There's a few things to keep in mind before George goes all A-team here. Remember, France and England aren't at war. In fact, French soldiers spared that group of 33 fort builders we just mentioned a minute ago for that very reason. Oh, and last I checked, ambushing a group of soldiers is an act of war. George does have permission to go down this road if needed, but it's supposed to be a last option thing. What we are seeing here is George's youth and inexperience. Half King, on the other hand, has plenty to gain. Keep in mind the French are now building forts on his turf. So of course, a swift ambush on the French sounds great to him. And so it goes down at the break of dawn. The French version says it's 7 a.m., May 28, 1754, when George and Half King attacked the 32 unsuspecting French soldiers eating their breakfast. The French call it a massacre. George calls it a fair fight. And it's hard to say because the reports vary. George tells us 10 French are killed and that half King's braves scalp the dead. Private John Shaw, an Irishman of 20 years serving under George, says 13 to 14 French die and the survivors are taken prisoner. The French say George's men fire first. George says the French fire first. Massacre or not, the most important detail is that someone kills the French party's leader, Joseph Coulon, Sieur de Jumonville. According to an unnamed Braves version later told to the French, a Virginian shoots Jumonville in the head during negotiations. According to other accounts, though, Half King kills him. The chief identifies Jumonville as the leader after the battle. While George is trying to talk to Jumonville through an interpreter, Half King comes up to him and says, Tu n'es pas encore mort, mon père. Which is French for, You're not yet dead, my father. And with that, Half King quickly pulls out a tomahawk and sinks it into the Frenchman's head, splitting his skull in two. (laughs) Private Shaw reports the Seneca chief then washes his hands with the brains. What a moment, and it leaves a bit to unpack. How is our untrained, non-French speaking, barely an adult, and in his first little battle, future president taking this in, I wonder? I would guess with shock. He just watched a man, with whom he's had a rather decent rapport for about half a year, squeeze Jumonville's brains through his fingers like jello. And why did Half King do it? <laughs> 
Obviously, today, we'd call this a war crime, and I don't defend the act. But I will ask you to remember this is a different time. Like I said earlier, customs, morals, social protocol, they can all vary. Furthermore, Half King did claim the French had, I quote, boiled and eaten his father. Yeah. He said that. If that's true, I'd call that a crueler death and a hatchet to the head. So is this revenge? Half King could also feel pretty desperate about the position of his people with French advancement. Maybe this was an emotional reaction. Maybe it was calculated to try and make sure the English went to war with the French to possibly push out these invaders. Whatever the reason, we'll never know exactly. And while circumstances and other accuracies in Private John Shaw's account give it great credibility, you've got to decide for yourself which account you believe. The French, the Virginians, or the Indians, all of which differ. Regardless of who did it, Jumonville's death is serious. His men are angry, livid, waving papers, and yelling out. I can imagine the scene. Qu'est-ce que vous avez fait? Vous êtes assassin! Vous avez tué un diplomate! C'est un acte de guerre, ça! Êtes-vous fou? All the while, George looks at his translator. Finally, it comes out. Jumonville was going to speak with the English. He had the exact same mission George fulfilled last winter. Jumonville was to tell the English to leave French Ohio. George is now responsible, to some degree, for the death of a diplomat. And the young lieutenant colonel totally doesn't grasp the gravitas of this. Well, after this, George returns to the rest of his men in that meadow, and construction of Fort Necessity continues for the next month. 200 or so more men and nine swivel guns, which are small cannon, arrive from Virginia. Another company shows up from South Carolina. George is so inexperienced and so unaware of the French's superior numbers, he even wants to take the fight to the French. But that's not going to happen. In early July, 600 French soldiers and 100 Indian allies descend on George's fort. Half King and his braves are long gone. Once they heard the French were coming, they left. Though he did warn George before bailing that his little fort, Fort Necessity, is crap. And when those French and Indian forces show up, George sees just how right Half King was. And now we're back to where we first met George. He's in the fort. He's soaked in the rain. He's splashed with blood. And I believe we left off with the rum. Night is falling. Incredibly, the French stop shooting around 8 p.m. A voice calls out to the fort. Voulez-vous parler? Do you want to talk? Well, of course George wants to talk. The French have him over a barrel. Why would they even want to give him a way out? You know what? Doesn't matter. He has no choice but to accept a parley. So George, who again has no skill in French, sends out Van Braam, his interpreter. While waiting on Van Braam, he does a count. More than one-third of his 400 men are dead or wounded, and there's almost no food or gunpowder. Yeah, George will count himself lucky no matter what terms the French give. Van Braam returns. I'm guessing he's grinning from ear to ear. Amazingly, the French commander, Coulon de Villiers, will let them leave with their colors and honor. George only needs to sign a document. It states that peace remains between France and England, but that the French attack on Fort Necessity was justified because of George's ambush on the French diplomat, Jumonville. You see, this isn't just political. It's personal. That dead diplomat was the half-brother of this French commander. Villiers wanted to avenge him. And at this point, the French commander feels satisfied that, with over 100 casualties, George has answered for it. There are some conditions, though. George has to leave two officers with the French as prisoners. All of his men must leave and not return to the Ohio within a year's time. And the piece de résistance, the document calls George an assassin, an assassin. It holds him responsible for Jumonville's death 
in writing. There's a good chance George doesn't quite get what he's signing. He doesn't speak French. He doesn't read French. He doesn't know how this is going to impact international relations. He's only 22 years old. He was never trained for this. If he had been, perhaps he'd have tried to negotiate some softer wording. Not knowing better, though, he signs. The next morning, July 4th, 1754, the document is delivered to the French. That's right. On the 4th of July, 22 years to the day before the signing of the Declaration of Independence, George has signed a document that will help launch the Seven Years' War the outcome of which will greatly contribute to the eventual signing of the Declaration of Independence and the American Revolution. How's that for ironic? With that signed, George and all of his surviving men, apart from the two officers left with the French, return home. But despite the assurances of peace on the paper George has signed, war comes swiftly. Taking the battle of Fort Necessity as an indicator of things to come, many American Indian tribes side with the French to make sure they stick with the winners. Unfortunately for them, they choose incorrectly. But it does mean Britain has a rougher go for it. Oh, and George's reputation? Well, in Europe, he's taking some of the blame for the war. One French poet puts this to pen. Quote, The assassination of Jumonville is a monument of perfidy, that ought to enrage eternity. Close quote. George plays right into the stereotype of colonials back in England. A bumbling failure, playing at military officer. But back in the colonies, George is basically the man. After all, didn't he win his first smaller battle? And who's the Virginian who bravely stood up to an army roughly twice the size of his and rallied his men to continue fighting until the French gave quarter? Damn straight, you know. That's our hometown hero, George. His legend only grows as he fights on in this war breaking out between France and Britain in 1754. Especially that bit about him coming out of a battle with bullet holes through his clothes while not a single one ever touched him. By the end of the war, his name will be on the lips of colonials far beyond the colony of Virginia. And you know the funny thing? Both versions of George, Europe's and America's, are kind of right. Now, we cannot leave out how the world changes because of this war. I mean, these changes set up the problems between Parliament and the American colonies that will go unanswered fester, exacerbate, and turn into a full-on war for independence. For starters, the war, called both the French and Indian War and the Seven Years' War. Two names, one war, keep that in mind. This war will rage around the globe. Other allies are drawn in, and battles are fought in Europe and even India. This is a real all-out slugfest between France and Britain over colonial might. And Britain wins. The war comes to a close in 1763. Britain takes nearly all of France's mainland North American territory east of the Mississippi, from Canada down to Louisiana. France's American holdings are reduced to a few Caribbean islands where slave-run plantations make great wealth for the French. In fact, those islands are so profitable, Britain got France to give up all of its North American territory by promising to return the islands it captured during the war, Guadeloupe and Martinique. France gave its territory west of the Mississippi to its ally, Spain. This partly compensates Spain for Britain also taking the Floridas from them at the end of the war. All of this territorial expansion might sound good for Britain, but that isn't entirely the case. See, this war gets colonial Americans to do something new. To start to see themselves a little bit as a united group. You know that flag that says join or die with a snake on it? People often think it comes from the revolution. And don't get me wrong, they'll use it then. But the image starts as a political cartoon drawn by this guy named Benjamin Franklin during this war, the Seven Years' War. And the colonials don't need Britain as much. They no longer have France breathing down their necks. No other major European power is near them. So, who needs the crown? 
And on top of all that, Britain's going broke over the war. The crown's debt roughly doubled during it from about 72 million pounds up to more than 130 million pounds. Let me put that another way. The debt is equal to some tens of trillions of dollars in today's money, and making the interest payment alone will require higher taxes. Oh, and there's the 10,000 additional troops needed to protect all that territory. This costs about another 220,000 pounds per year. And it's a good call, by the way, as Pontiac's war in 1763 will demonstrate. Well, that's a lot of money. Given that Britain's finances are stretched, who's going to pay for all these troops and other costs of running this expanded empire in America? The colonists feel they did their part during the war. Parliament and many back in Britain see the colonies as partly responsible for the war and freeloading a bit. This is going to get messy. All right, I'd like to tell you what we're doing next time. But first, if you enjoyed bonding with George today, please be sure to like, share, and subscribe. You can also join the podcast's Facebook page or follow on Instagram or Twitter at History That Doesn't Suck. Also, you can hit me up personally on Twitter at Prof. Greg Jackson or through the website, which is historythatdoesntsuck.com. And if you're really digging this podcast and think bi-weekly just won't be frequent enough, please consider a $2 per month Patreon subscription you'll find us at patreon.com forward slash history that doesn't suck. That again is patreon.com forward slash history that doesn't suck. You can get access to new episodes a few days early and help me move towards my goal of hiring the help I would need to make this a weekly podcast. Now, have you ever heard about Patrick Henry's crazy oratory skills? Yeah, he's the one who gave the give me liberty or give me death bit, but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the time he lit up the American colonies by heavily implying someone should maybe assassinate King George. It could be treason to speak like this, but Patrick apparently didn't care. And have you heard of a group calling themselves the Sons of Liberty? They aren't the most peaceful bunch. We'll get into their origins as Bostonians tear things down, burn some stuff, and threaten a stamp distributor. Catch up with me in episode two, where I'd like to tell you a story. (laughs) 